Well, here we are again, church. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us today. We're gonna worship from wherever you're at. We're right here. Let's sing praises to him. Come on. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a
Hello, and welcome to Believer's Church. My name is Heather, and I'm so glad you're joining us for worship today. Whether you're watching through Believer's app, Facebook Live, YouTube, or our online campus through believerschurch.org, our hope is that you'll experience the love Jesus offers. If you're connecting with our online campus, you've likely already met your host and are connecting with others who are worshiping with you. A couple great things about the online campus is you're able to ask questions, interact with others during the service, and request prayer. So be sure to take advantage of all those great opportunities. I want to invite all of you to let us know that you're participating in today's service by filling out a communication card. You'll find it on the Believers app, which you can download from the Apple and Google Play stores. If you're a first time guest today, make sure to let us know by checking that block. We have a special gift we'd like to get in the mail for you this week. The communication card is also a place where you can request prayer and take next steps based on today's message. Each week, our staff reads through the cards and prays for you. This month, every two check-ins will provide a vitamin to a child in need. We're working with Cosley and Vitamin Angels to make it happen. You can add hashtag give vitamins when you post to Facebook and Instagram to promote the cause. For more information, check out vitaminangels.org. Have you been coming to Believers for a little while now and interested in what it means to be a member? Well, I wanna invite you to join me for our very first virtual Be Committed class happening on May 17th. You can sign up on the communication card or under the events tab on our app and website. Once you register, we'll send you an email with the Zoom link and participation guide. We look forward to telling you a little bit more about Believers Church and answering all your questions. We're so grateful for the opportunities we have to come alongside our community, local partners, and Believers families during this season of uncertainty. Ministry isn't stopping. In fact, God's opening doors for us to be even more purposeful in making Jesus number one, one person at a time. When you give to Believers, you're making a difference. In the last couple weeks, we've been able to provide dinner and game nights for families that embrace foster care. We stock shelves at Oasis Social Ministries, and we've even come alongside some of our very own Believers families facing some financial stress. Today, I'm asking you to continue to give generously. You can do so through the Give tab on the app or website or by texting BCVA to 77977. Thank you for your continued partnership in the gospel. Today, we're continuing our viral series and we're gonna be talking about self-worth. As we prepare to hear this very important message, let's continue our time of worship. So today is Mother's Day, and I just want to say happy Mother's Day to all of you superhero moms out there. And I know for some of you, this might be a tough day. Maybe you lost your mom, maybe you don't have a good relationship with your mom, or maybe you're trying so desperately to become a mom. And from someone who went through a two-year battle with infertility, I completely understand how tough today may be for you. But I just want to encourage you, wherever you are in that spectrum, to not tune out, but to allow God to speak to you today. And this next song that we're about to sing, it's really been significant for me over the past couple months. And I love the second verse of this. It says, here in the waiting, I won't worry about tomorrow. There's no need to focus on the things I can't control all my attention on the wonder of this moment and Jesus your presence is the comfort of my soul and I don't know about you but it's pretty much utter chaos at my house these days my husband and I are chasing our two and three year old around while trying to work full time from home and just it can be overwhelming sometimes and our three year old especially he is wide open from the time he wakes up until the time he finally goes to bed. And we always tell him before he goes to bed, we say, do not come out of your room until it's light outside. And 
sure enough, the past couple days, he comes running in our room right at daybreak and flings the curtain open and says, Mommy, Daddy, look, Jesus made that. And in that moment, all my attention is on my son and is on Jesus. And so I just wanna encourage you to find those moments in the midst of all this chaos. The moments where you can just sit in the presence of Jesus and be in awe of him. So as we continue to worship, I just wanna encourage you to just be present in this moment as we continue to sing together.
And I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear Oh, I am a child of God Hey, believers, good to have you with us. Uh, my name is Jamie. I am one of the pastors here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, for those of you who are just kind of checking us out or you're, you're tuning in until your church reopens, uh, we're really glad that you're here and feel free to hang out just as long as you want to. Uh, today's Mother's Day, so I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the, the moms out there. Hopefully, uh, because it's Mother's Day and we're, we're doing this service here, but you're at home, hopefully you're in bed being served this big breakfast by your kids or your husband. Uh, in fact, you could check in uh, and you can post uh, those pictures of, of you being treated so good by your family on Mother's Day. And if that's not what's happening, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I want to say we don't typically do a, a message that's tailored to Mother's Day or Father's Day um, because uh, for a lot of people, it's not a, it's not a great day. Uh, families struggling with infertility, for example, uh, it's a painful day. Um, and for others, there's just painful memories that kind of come up around that day. Uh, but having said that, today's message really is pretty applicable to you moms. Um, I, I hope it's applicable to, to everybody. Um, but I, I know a lot, of, a lot of moms, especially younger moms, who really struggle uh, with um, who they are as moms. They're struggling to feel like they're, they're measuring up. And there's so much pressure today around... Um, you know, measuring up to everything that's going on. You know, you, you hop on your social feeds and you see uh, a mom who has, you know, maybe her kids at the, at the dinner room table and, and the kids, they're bathed, uh, they're dressed, their clothes, you know, they all match each other. They're smiling as if they're actually having fun and enjoying themselves. And at the center of the table is this homemade centerpiece uh, that the mom found on Pinterest or, or whatever. And then uh, the meal that's being served, you got to get a picture of that. Uh, the, the meal looks like it was prepared by a, a professional chef or whatever. And you, you're sitting there looking at, at this picture of, of family bliss. And then you, you look at your family and, and uh, there's like McDonald's wrappers and stuff on the couch, you, your kids may or may not even have clothes on and everyone's yelling at each other and you're telling everyone to shut up. Um, and you just, you just think, you know, man, compared to what's going on out there, I'm, I'm a terrible mom. I'm, I'm, I'm a failure at this thing. Uh, and, and when you compare your normal with everybody else, it, it really kind of goes after your sense of accomplishment. And if you're a mom, maybe you can relate to that. But the reality is, um, it's not just moms who are struggling with this. Um, there's all kinds of people who are, who are struggling today with, with who they are as they compare themselves to, to what's going on out there. Uh, men and women who are struggling with body image, and it's leading to all kinds of problems, uh, self-harm, uh, eating disorders, all kinds of problems that are generated through this struggle that we, uh, that is just kind of a pandemic today. Um, and it's this whole idea of struggling with self-worth. So I want to give you some terms that we're going to, uh, that, that are related to the topic of the day. Uh, the first one is self-image, and that is just, um, you know, how you perceive uh, you know, your looks, your personality, uh, that kind of stuff, you know, how you view yourself. The, another term that we're going to use is, um, is self-esteem. And, and self-esteem is really more around uh, self-respect. It's, it's uh, determining 
um, you know, how, how good you feel about yourself. And then the, the last term is self-worth. And it's just the, the, the value that you place on yourself com- really often in comparison with other people. Like, how good are you? How, how appreciated are you? How, how worthy are you? And all of these terms are kind of related to one another. I'm going to use the term self-worth throughout the, the talk today to encompass all three of those. So when you hear me say self-worth, that, those are the things that I'm talking about. Um, you know, what's going on in our culture around self-esteem and self-worth um, is really a contradiction because our culture is increasingly feeling self-entitled and privileged Uh, There's this rising sense of entitlement, and yet at the same time, there's also this rising struggle of self-worth, and that seems to be uh, a contradiction, Uh, but I think what's happening in our culture today is actually feeding it, and I'll I'll tell you what I mean by that, Uh, and if you're taking notes, and I I hope you will, jot down this this first idea. It's the big lie of our culture that is feeding the the problem that we're talking about today. And the big lie is this. It's that comparison determines my self-worth. So when I, I look around and I compare myself to other people and other people's situations, it's that comparison, how I'm doing in measuring myself against how they're doing, that, that I use to determine my self-worth. And that is, I mean, you think about it, before everyone got locked into their homes for this extended period of time, our entire economy ran on this idea. Uh, this idea that, um, you know, if I got to look around and compare myself to what other people have, and based on that comparison, I determine how good I'm doing. And uh, so, you know, you look around and you think, um, you know, if I had a, a car like that, uh, I would be, I would feel good about myself. I would feel like I've arrived. If I had a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or whatever, like that, that looked like that, that would be the, the ticket for me. If I um, I would probably be happy if I had that. If I had a house that big or in that neighborhood or with that view or in that school district or, or whatever it is, if I had that, that would, be, that would be the thing that makes me feel good about where I'm at in life. If I had a lawn that looked like that, if, if my weight was this ideal weight or if my height was this height, or if my teeth were as white as that person's, then I would feel better about myself. And it's this whole thing of comparison. I look around and I compare myself to what other people have and what other people are doing and who I perceive they are, their value. And I use that to determine my own self-worth. Um, you know, if... If I had more, I would feel better about myself. I would feel successful. I would feel f- fulfilled. I would feel satisfied. Um, I would feel confident. And so we, we compare, we use comparison to determine this sense of self. And, and there's no shortage of places to compare. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, forever ago, I guess, you know, it was magazines and, and television or whatever, but now... Uh, There's so many, I'm not even going to mention all the different social media platforms because there's probably going to be a new one tomorrow, but there's so many platforms that you can go on and you can, you can compare yourself to what other people are, uh, how they look and what they're doing. And you have all of these comparisons now to, to determine your self-worth based on what's going on uh, with all these other people and people that you look up to as the ideal and you see them, you know, peddling their products and um, their looks. And then you compare that with yourself and it's, it's this struggle. And, and here's the thing. Today, if you don't like how you look in comparison to other people or what you have or any of the, those other things, you can fix it. Um, you, you can use filters, filters that, that kind of fake it. Uh, so you can change your skin tone with a filter if you don't like your current skin tone. You can uh, make your eyes look 
uh, bigger and your teeth whiter and, and on and on. And if filters aren't enough, uh, then you can do surgery. You can do plastic surgery, cosmetic dental surgery, uh, body sculpting surgery. You can get implants on the top, on the bottom. Uh, you can make your lips more plump. You can change the color of your eyes. I mean, there's, there's no end to the things. There's an entire industry that's built around this idea of comparison and self-worth, and people are spending gobs of money on it. So compare yourself to others to determine your self-worth. That is the big lie of our culture. And it's not, this is kind of interesting, it's not a new lie. It's been around forever. Solomon, he's an ancient king of Israel, probably 3,000 years ago, uh, he wrote these words and he said, uh, I observed that, that most people are motivated to success. I mean, think about this, 3,000 years ago, most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors because they look around and they compare themselves to what their neighbors have and they determine uh, what they need to get in order to keep up with the Joneses uh, that long ago. And he says, but this is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. It's, it's something that, that's never going to bring satisfaction. You're never going to get a sense of self-worth if, if that's how you are arriving at it by comparing yourself with other people. It's a big lie. So what's the truth? Well, the, the truth, if you, if you could be objective, and it's really hard to be, but if you could be, um, to the, the truth about your self-worth is, is simply this, um, and it's that comparison, it, it destroys your self-worth. It doesn't determine it. It wrecks it. It destroys it. Uh, when you look around and you compare yourself to other people, it's, it's not making you feel better about yourself. It's making you feel worse. Uh, I've told this story before, but this was years ago. Every year I try to go away for a, a week or so on a motorcycle adventure. And um, I remember this day we were up in the, the, the mountains of North Carolina. And uh, we'd spent the day riding. This was on my my the bike that I used to have. I owned that bike for 10 years, put 50,000 miles on it, loved the bike. And we were riding around the mountains in North Carolina and it's just some of the best motorcycle roads on the East Coast. And uh, the weather was beautiful and I'm with friends that I'm enjoying. And I mean, just life could not have been any better. And we rolled into Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, coming into town. And I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, life just doesn't get any better than this. I'm like, this bike is running great. It, I, I love uh, what I'm doing, who I'm doing it with, what I'm, what I'm doing it on. Like everything about this day is perfect. And I get up to this red light and this newer bike uh, with, you know, more chrome, better accessories, louder pipes, whatever, uh, rolls up next to me. And I, I remember just kind of looking over at it and then looking back at my own. And I was like, can't believe I have to ride this piece of junk, you know, the rest of the week. This is terrible. Uh, that's, what, that's what comparison does. It just destroys your sense of contentment and, and self-worth. That's, that's what comparison does. So I log on to my social media feeds and I see perfection. I see perfect everywhere. Perfect homes, perfect kids, uh, perfect marriages, perfect bodies, just, just perfect and then I, I look at me and what do I see? You know, I, I see, you know, my house with, uh, you know, dirty underwear on the floor and a spouse who uh, hasn't had a bath in like five days. I mean, that's one of the downsides of the pandemic, right? And no one, no one cares what they look like. So your spouse hasn't had a bath in five days. You, you look in the kitchen and it, it looks like, uh, you know, a kitchen from the 80s. It desperately needs to be redone. You look at your kids and you, you see kids that need braces. Um, and, you know, you just, you, you look around you and you see all the stuff that you, you don't have. Uh, in fact, you look in the mirror and what do you see? You see, you know, receding hairline wrinkles where they, you know, flab where you don't want it, all the stuff. Now, interestingly, the Bible, it, it says that we ought to look around, but not to compare ourselves. 
That's the, the big difference. You ought to look around. Uh, Paul was writing uh, to the church in Galatia. It's a group of believers a lot like uh, us, even though we're gathered virtually. We're the church where we are. And here's what Paul said to them. He said, share each other's burdens. So look around and, and share each other's burdens. And in this way, you are obeying the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. So Paul says, look around you. Yeah, take, take time to, to look around you, but not to compare yourself. That's going to destroy yourself. It's, it's to look around to see if others have needs. See, what we typically do is we look around and um, we try to make ourselves feel better by the comparison. But what Paul is telling us to do is to look around and help others feel better by what we share with them. Uh, we, we come along those who are struggling. It's such a good word. And then later, Paul says this. He says, pay careful attention to your own work. So look around you to help other people. But when it comes to comparison, just do your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. You won't need to. This, by the way, is our, our memory verse for the day. For we're each responsible for our own conduct. So, yeah, look around so you can help. But don't look around to compare. Uh, that's going to that's gonna wreck you. Uh, and there's so many people who are struggling with this today. And I know a bunch of you who are watching uh, or listening, you struggle with this. And um, I'm very, very grateful that you're going to have an opportunity to hear from uh, someone from Believer's Church. Her name is Lauren Bradley, and a longtime friend, and uh, super engaged here. She grew up in our church here, and um, she now leads at the table, which is a uh, ministry to young adults, and she uh, leads in student ministry. She oversees um, B groups for the table and serves uh, with our team that tries to keep all of our, our B groups, which are our, our version of small groups, going. So uh, just a, a, a hardworking person who loves the Lord and is very well connected here. And she has agreed to share um, her journey uh, with her sense of self-worth with you. And so I hope you will lean in and uh, learn from Lauren. Hey Believers, my name is Lauren and I'm just going to share a little bit of my experience um, with self-worth and identity with you today. Um, honestly, I've always struggled to love and accept the way that I look. I've always felt like I'm missing out on something because I'm not the right acceptable size or I don't have the right skin tone or perfectly glowing skin and hair. And as I was thinking about this, honestly, I can probably trace these feelings about myself all the way back to when I was about eight or nine. I remember very specific comments uh, made about my body, including, but not limited to, being a chunky kid, having thick thighs, and my favorite, I still remember it, being called Porky Georgie. Of course, these comments didn't stop throughout adolescence. I became extremely self-conscious. I was terrified to put myself in any kind of vulnerable situation. And time after time, boys that I liked would friend zone me and, my, and like my friends who were thinner, they had straighter teeth or had tanner skin. So looking back, I realized through that that I developed an excessive need for affirmation through relationships. And since none of the boys wanted to date me, the only way I could get the affirmation I desperately needed was through friendships. So I learned how to make myself indispensable to those around me, fulfilling others' needs, being the fixer, and finding my self-worth through how other people needed me became alarmingly normal. You can imagine how devastating and destructive this became if a friendship fell apart or if I made a mistake. It wasn't just a fight with a friend, it was my entire identity crumbling because my self-worth was based on what I was absorbing through others. And I'd love to say that this pattern was healed and broken in adulthood, but we all know that lifelong patterns don't just stop. 
So I created a pattern, new pattern for myself in dating relationships as becoming the fixer. It was kind of like, okay, you've got seriously deep seated issues. That's perfect, lucky you, because I've built this amazing savior complex around myself and I'm really good at solving all of them, which I, I'm sure you can imagine was super healthy. I continued thriving off the feeling of being needed by my friends and I grew a very large circle of people around me to keep feeding into the lie I had created as a child, that I'm only loved, valued, and worthy because of the things that I do. And finally, in last year, in 2019, a series of events and some really hard self-realizations caused me to seek out professional counseling to realign the foundations of self-worth. I haven't arrived and I'm honestly, I don't think I'm close to perfecting my foundation of self-worth. I struggle every single day to keep my eyes on Jesus instead of looking around to others for affirmation. But Jesus graciously brings me back to him every time I look away. And I know that I'm not alone in this constant struggle of identity and self-worth. I've had countless conversations with friends, with students in For Real, with young adults at the table. And I know the enemy is ruthless in attacking our foundation of what makes us worthy of love that inhibits our relationships, not only with God, but with others. And um, maybe your struggle looks a little bit different than mine. Mine's very external, but maybe yours is more internal comparisons. I think things that I hear all the time are questions or thoughts like, I'll never be good enough, or, oh, if you've only known the things that I've done, or I don't deserve to be happy, or there's no way someone else, let alone God, could accept every single part of me. Does that sound familiar? If no one has told you before, I'd love to be the one to tell you that there is nothing you can do to fix yourself to make God love you more than he already does. Through Christ, you are worthy and you are enough. There's a verse that I love in Ephesians 1:4, and it says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So because of God's character, we are without fault through Jesus. I don't know about y'all, that might be the best news that I've ever heard, and it keeps me grounded and keeps my head clear where I need to be. Jesus has a really good work planned for you. He wants you to love others selflessly, without requirements, just as he loved us. Personally, in my struggle of self-worth, I was unable to love others selflessly because I needed affirmation back. So if you didn't give me affirmation, you didn't receive love from me. And that's definitely not how God has called me to love others in my life. Finding more and more of my self-worth in Christ actually enables me to love others better and without any expectations. So what is your broken self-worth, identity, or self-image holding you back from? My prayer for you is that hearing my story would help you answer that question for yourself in order to love God and love others more. Aren't you glad that uh, Lauren shared her story uh, just so so good and um, I, I know so relatable as well. And like she said, she's, she's not arrived. It's, a, it's this constant thing that uh, we have to continuously work on. And so I, I just want you to know that uh, we're praying, Lauren and I are praying that today's talk is just helpful to you in your journey. Um, I, I want to I, I wanna wrap this up uh, to talk about how we do determine our, our worth. Um, many of you know this, right out of college, I, I was a car salesman. Don't hold it against me. Um, I hated it. I hated every minute of it. I did it for three years. Uh, one year at a Honda dealership and then two years at an independent uh, used car lot in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And there was this interesting phenomenon that happens in car sales. And if you've ever bought a car or traded a car, you are probably guilty of this because it was almost universal across the board. Uh, when someone is buying a car, especially a used car, uh, the objective is to point out every problem that this car has so that you can, in theory, you're going to get the price of the car down. So, you know, you don't like the color of it. You don't like the scratch on it. You don't like the whatever on it. And so you talk down the car that you're buying um, 
But then when it comes to the trade, you do the opposite, right? So you talk up the value of the trade. In fact, to listen to most customers who came in with a trade in, you wondered why they were getting rid of this car. It sounds so amazing. Uh, everything on it is brand new. It works great. And yet they're buying your piece of junk from you. It just didn't make any sense. But anyway, the, the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is people would come in and they would say, you know, here's this car, my used car, and here's what it's worth. And they would always overestimate its worth. Almost 100% of the time, they would overestimate the worth. And they would even sometimes have documentation to say why it's worth what it's worth. You know, they'd use the, the used car guide or whatever and say, yeah, I didn't know it's worth, you know, say it's worth $10,000. Um, and I would try to explain to people, you know, the worth of your car is not what it says in a book. And you know this, um, the worth of something is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. That's really what determines the worth. It doesn't matter what a book says. It doesn't matter what you say. Uh, worth is determined by what someone is willing to pay. Now, that's true in cars. That's true in, in objects. But here's where I'm going with all of this. Um, it's true about your worth as well. You know, looking around you to determine your self-worth, that is a big lie. The truth is, looking around you to compare yourself with others, it destroys your self-worth. Um, so what do you do if you're struggling with self-esteem or self-worth or self-image? What do we say to people who are struggling with who they are or how they view themselves, how they value themselves? Um, what do we say to people who, you know, hate how they appear and are struggling to, to project a different image? about themselves to, to people around them? What do we say to people who are discouraged and defeated because they think they will never really measure up to whatever that magical standard is out there? And this is where hope and help come in. And this is where the really good news comes in. Um, and that is this, your worth was determined 2,000 years ago by God himself. Um, because he placed an infinite value upon you. So we've looked at the lie, we've looked at the truth, but now I want to look at the, the, the big news, and it's this. The crucifixion, Jesus coming and dying, that is what defines my self-worth, because Jesus was willing to pay everything for you. Um, that, that's just such incredible news. Um, this thing that has us gathering together around our, around our you know, monitors, our screens, our phones, uh, whatever it is we're watching this on, uh, is the, the, the truth of Jesus, God in the flesh, that he came to earth uh, to purchase your freedom from sin. And here's the truth. We're all born sinners. We, we, we all... You know, if we were to compare ourselves to the thing worth comparing ourselves to, which is the only standard really that matters, God's standard, uh, and we were to look at God's standard and compare ourselves with that, we would fall way short of God's standard because God's standard of holiness is perfection. And none of us measure up. None of us meet God's expectation. Um, the Bible calls that sin. We're born sinners. We're, we're born separated from God, cut off from God. And then on top of that, not only are we born that way, but then we, we are sinners. So, you know, you do things every day. Every day. I do things that don't measure up to God's standard, which is perfection. So we sin. Not only are we born sinners, but we we live as sinners, and the truth is, all of us will eventually die as sinners. And if sin separates us from God, cuts us off from God, and we go through life cut off from God, the truth is, if you die in your sin, you die cut off from God. Nothing changes just because you took your last breath. So you, you go into eternity cut off from God. 
Uh, we're all in the same boat, all of us. But for Jesus is the only reason that any of us have any hope. I uh, look at these amazing words written by Paul, and he explains um, this, this truth to us. He says, God, in all his fullness, full of God, was pleased to live in Christ. In other words, Jesus is fully God. All of God's presence lived in Jesus. Then he continues. He says, and through him, God reconciled, or that is to bring together everything to himself. He made peace with, that's another way to say reconciled. He, he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth. How? How did, how did Jesus do this? Uh, by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Uh, the blood of, think about that, the blood of Jesus, the life of Jesus is the life of God himself. And, and God says, your value is determined by the blood of my son, Jesus. That's how much value that you have. Uh, how amazing is that? Now, here's the crazy thing. Even when it comes to spiritual things, we all have a tendency to even continue this silly comparison game. And we think, you know, well, okay, well, God loves me. But then, you know, then I blew it yesterday and now God's kind of sick of me, right? Or you look at other people and you say, man, I, I think I love Jesus, but compared to that person, I'm not really doing that, that great. Or you've, you've probably heard this expression. I know I've, I've used it to describe people who endure a lot. You know, there's a, a special place in heaven for that person. Uh, what are we saying? We're saying that person's exceptionally good, uh, they get a special place in heaven. I'm not that good, obviously, but that person there, man, they get a special place in heaven. And we're comparing ourselves and allowing comparison to even destroy our sense of value, even though our value, value is determined by what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so Paul goes on to continue this, who we are, describing who we are apart from Christ. And he said, this includes you. You were once far away from God. You were his enemies. You were separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Even the stuff that you did yesterday, yeah, that your evil, it separates you from, from him. That, you know, your thoughts, your actions, they're, they're not measuring up. But then he continues and he says this. He says, yet now he has reconciled, there's that word again, he's brought you together to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. So he's, he's taking care of that for you. And as a result, this is who you are today. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, as a result, he's brought you into his own presence and you are holy. That is without sin. You are blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Imagine that. Imagine you standing before God and God is not disgusted. God is not displeased with your performance. God sees you as holy, as righteous, as blameless, not because you're so good, but because Jesus is so good. Because Jesus says, because of his sacrifice for your sin, all of those faults, all of those things that don't measure up, paid for, covered, by me. Um, and God sees us through the sacrifice of his son. Just amazing. You see, the truth is we have it all wrong. There's a, there is a pandemic sweeping our world. Um, and the pandemic is uh, that so many people are worshiping themselves. This, this self-adoration that is going on. That's what's driving all of this stuff. And people are looking around them and they're determining their value based on other people around them. And, and there's no room for God because uh, I'm so busy looking around. Um, there's no room for God mainly because for most of us, we're just so full of ourselves. We don't have room for God. And we have this unhealthy obsession with self. That's the pandemic. Self-worth mingled with self-worship. Uh, worship, by definition, is when you ascribe worth to something. And our culture is obsessed 
with ascribing worth to self, self-worship. And so we measure every one based on what we see. That's how much worth and worship I'm going to ascribe myself. But real freedom, freedom from the tyranny of the self-image comes when you ascribe worth to the only one worthy, Jesus, and we worship him and we ascribe him the worth that he is due because of what he has done for us. He purchased our freedom. So stop looking around to others to determine your worth. Instead, look to the one who says, you were worth the blood of my son. Let's look at some next steps that we might take as a result of being here. Maybe for you, uh, this is the first time that you've even understood what it is that Jesus did or accomplished or was even about. And you know, you've, you've heard about Jesus. Maybe you're familiar with the idea that he came and that he died, but you didn't understand that he came and died for you. But he did. And maybe today you're going to say, you know what, I'm going I'm to receive the worth that you've ascribed to me. And you're going to say yes to Jesus and um, commit yourself to following him. I'll pray with you in just a second. Maybe you want to memorize that verse in Galatians 6, 4, and 5 that talks about not comparing yourself with others, uh, which leads to that next step there. Um, maybe to stop looking around to determine your worth, you're going to have to dial back the amount of time you spend on social media. I mean, for a lot of people, it's just an unhealthy obsession. And if you're using it to determine your worth, that's a really good reason to step back. And maybe that's your next step today. Uh, we, have a, we have a link or a download uh, that we have available for you. If you want to learn a little bit more about your value, um, about who you are because of Jesus, uh, I would love for you to spend a little bit of time reading some verses. There's not tons of them. It's just like a one sheet. Uh, but there's so much more about what God thinks about you based on what Jesus, uh, how Jesus determined your worth. And so if you uh, want to just go a little bit further, not only does he see you as blameless um, before him, but there's you're his son or his daughter. There's, there's all of these things that he sees about you. And I would love to, uh, for you to, to get that and spend some time reading and praying and thinking and maybe journaling um, these truths about how God sees you so that when you look around or if you're struggling with your sense of self-worth, you can go back to this and you can say, no, 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 that's what the enemy is saying about me, but this is what God says about me. I, I hope you will take that step today. Uh, so whatever your next step is, uh, let me just kind of uh, wrap us up by praying for you. So if you would, if you're watching at home or listening at home, um, just bow your head for a second. Let's close our eyes, uh, not for any other reason, but to give God our undivided attention in this moment. Father, I want to pray for each one listening, watching, uh, each one who has maybe been suffering with a crippling sense of self-worth that is, is they're not, they don't sense their value. They don't sense that they're measuring up. Um, and I pray that through the talk today, they would take their eyes off of themselves, off of those around them, and they would instead fix their eyes on you. And Father, we are so very, very grateful that you have determined our worth by sending your son Jesus to pay for our sin, to purchase us and our freedom. That's a value that we, can, we can't even really comprehend. Uh, but I do pray that today that you would help us to, to soak in that truth that we are valuable because you say we are valuable. And so, Father, we thank you for, for that. And we thank you for Jesus who came to shed his blood on our behalf, who came to say, I love you and you are worthy. 
And Father, I pray for anyone who's outside of faith right now. And if that describes you, why don't you just pray with me right now? Just say yes to God. Say, say, Father, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you love me so much and you saw so much value in me that you sent Jesus to die in my place, to take away my sin, to give me your righteousness, to bring me into a right relationship with you so that I can be with you in this life and in the next. And so I say yes to the gift of forgiveness of sins. I say yes to following Jesus. Father, thank you that you invite us to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you did just pray with me to begin a relationship with Jesus, please let me know that. We have a book that I would love to get into your hands uh, that just talks about things that you can do to follow Jesus a little bit more closely. And I would love to get that into your hands. The way to do that is to uh, fill out the communication card online there and let me know, check that on the, the next steps that you were trusting in Jesus for the very first time today. Um, and, and make sure you include your mailing address and I will put that book in the mail to you this week. Uh, so that you can continue to learn and grow in your walk with Jesus. Thanks so much for being here this week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, I'm Rochelle, the Outreach Director here at Believers. I am so thankful for Jamie's message. What a beautiful reminder that our worth is found in Jesus. Today, we don't want to forget about all of the brave women who found themselves holding the title of mother when it was nowhere on their radar. In fact, the news catapulted their lives into crisis mode. Next, we're going to hear from one of our friends at Crisis Pregnancy Center who has made it her life's work to come alongside women facing crisis pregnancies and offer them the hope and healing found in our Savior. Hi, my name is Chandra Jarrett, the Director of Patient Programs at the Crisis Pregnancy Center, and I'm excited to be here for Mother's Day. If I can be honest with you, I will tell you that I have mixed emotions about Mother's Day. I have a wonderful son that I gave birth to at the age of 20, and a year later, I had an abortion. And so when Mother's Day comes around, I honestly celebrate my son while grieving the child that I aborted. And I know that Mother's Day is probably different for some of you as well, as you think of maybe a loss by miscarriage, or the loss of a child to a sickness, or even caring for a child, or maybe your mother wasn't present when you grew up. And that's what I love about what we do at the Crisis Pregnancy Center is because we see women with all of these stories. We are there to help women facing unplanned pregnancies like I was at the age of 19. And we're thankful to be able to provide services to them. I will tell you that for 25 years, I grieved my abortion. I was physically ill. I suffered with depression and grief because I didn't know how to grieve a child that I chose to take the life of. But through an abortion recovery class, through a pregnancy medical clinic like the Crisis Pregnancy Center, the Lord met me. He healed me. He forgave me. And I'm so grateful to be standing here today now you may be asking, what is the Crisis Pregnancy Center and what do we do? We are a local nonprofit who's been around for 34 years. We provide free pregnancy tests, free ultrasound, and free counseling. We counsel about abortion, about adoption, and about parenting because we want women to make an informed decision. And we also offer resources to women like our parenting class that provides her with practical skills as well as a spiritual lesson. We also have an abortion recovery class as I've mentioned. But what we wanna talk about today is the opportunity for life change. And we know we're living in unprecedented times with everything being virtual. It's unprecedented because we never thought we would face COVID-19. We knew that fear drives women to the abortion clinic before COVID-19. And we've seen a 75% increase in abortion-minded women coming into our clinics now. And so it's so important to have partners like you to help us to serve these women every day. We have five locations, three of which are still open. Our Virginia Beach Clinic, our Chesapeake Clinic, and our Norfolk Clinic. We are there six days a week right now seeing patients who are coming in who are afraid of having a baby during this pandemic. 
and your support will help us to continue to see these women day after day, week after week. Thank you for partnering with us and being a support with the Price Crisis Pregnancy Center. Because of partners like you, we're able to serve these women day after day, week after week. We love and appreciate you here at Believer's Church. What a powerful testimony. We're honored that Chandra was able to share her story with us and we are thrilled to begin our virtual life change baby bottle campaign. This event will last for the next few weeks. You can follow the link in the chat feed or in the message notes to donate your change and support the life-saving work of our friends at Crisis Pregnancy Center. Thank you for tuning in. It's a perfect day to grab lunch and video chat with one of your friends and family. Let's go be loved.